Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Our speaker today is Anthony Kinslow, uh, who just happened to be in town from the East Coast uh, today. And uh, our friend Home, Holmes Hummel alerted us to the fact uh, Anthony and Holmes actually have, uh, over the last three years, developed a uh, set of courses here at Stanford on energy equity. But that's not what he's going to They're going to come back next quarter or maybe in the fall and talk about that. What he's going to talk about today is um, kind of his own personal adventure, if I could call it that. Uh, uh, Anthony was a PhD uh, uh, in the uh, Sustainable Design and Construction Program here at Stan Stanford in Civil and Environmental Engineering about four or five years ago. And I think at, th at that point, um, he's the kind of guy that saw there was a big problem and was frustrated because there didn't seem to be an easy way to do it, and probably then concluded it was because it was nobody's job to solve it. And then he went out and did a startup called Gemini Energy Solutions to try to solve the problem. So he solved the problem of it being no one's problem by making it his personal problem. <laughs> so Anthony, tell us about how that went. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to the whole Energy Seminar team uh, for having me. I uh, wanna, before I jump into it, I wanna thank uh, Jane Woodward and Holmes Hummel, who are probably the two individuals most responsible for me teaching at Stanford University, uh, and as a result, being able to be here today uh, and uh, be here and talk to you about our work uh, with community, uh, community Anchors, our work in trying to accelerate the building decarbonization efforts, uh, transportation efforts, and really, I want to also give a shout out to uh, my partners in, in, in these endeavors, uh, our community anchor partner, Green the Church, who, you, as you'll see, is um, revolutionizing the, uh, what is most people consider the biggest issue, which is finding demand within these communities, right? Uh, uh, OpConnect uh, and Dexter Turner, CEO of OpConnect, and lastly, uh, Dr. Reginald Parker from Optimal Tech, all who uh, conversations with have sparked what I'm about to discuss today. Um, okay, so in this energy seminar, I'm gonna be talking a lot about the realities of different folks in this country, right? And how our limitation of not fully recognizing those realities have led to us really creating exacerbating effects in our, uh, uh, in our uh, attempt to decarbonize. It is creating a slowdown aspect in our attempts to accelerate our decarbonization. And I wanna bring in those different realities and how focusing on them, recognizing them, and embracing them will allow us to accelerate, using in particular community anchors, uh, cultural competency, and uh, microgrids for both revenue and resilience. I, now, I wanna key in on both revenue and resilience, and you'll see why uh, later on in this talk. But I would like to last say that this, I am a black man. <laughs> And so most of my stories of the literature that I'll be speaking to is gonna be from that context because that is what I'm most comfortable with. But to make uh, no mistake that this will be relevant cross-culturally, right? So everyone here should be able to take what I'm saying uh, and connect it to themselves personally, to their communities, and see how this could be applied there, okay? so. First, I should probably start with my journey and how I got here. Uh, I am a proud graduate of North Carolina Agricultural and Technical State University. Thank you, bro. It's mandatory that we do that after saying the name, by the way. <laughs> um, and it actually graduates the most black engineers in the country behind, uh, uh, um, with Georgia Tech being second, I believe. And during that time, I was surrounded by the black diaspora uh, folks from all over the um, black and uh, folks from all over the world coming here to learn about engineering and also folks who cared about energy and the environment all right so I very early on realized that wow there's a lot of folks that look like me who all also care about the energy who also care about the environment and are actively trying to do something about it right. and so I was able to hold on to that when I came to Stanford in 2013 where I uh, started in the sustainable design construction program focused on sustainable buildings, the design and operation of those buildings, and continued on to do my PhD in energy efficiency analytics, uh, 
And my PhD focused on taking statistics that is typically used in psychology, whether that be, uh, so Bayesian statistics typically used in psychology or epidemiology and applying that to our energy consumption, right? Understanding that behavior and how we identify and how we operate in a building drives the energy consumption. And it was then that I started to hear more about things such as identity-based motivation, right? This concept that if a task or activity does not resonate with your identity, then you're, least likely, you're less likely to actually follow through on that task or do that activity, right? So uh, I see this a lot in, in, in my space where you talk about going hiking. They're like, it's kind of a white thing to do. <laughs> and so that kind of comments, right, you hear, and I, you can, I, I encourage you to think through your stuff and say, oh, that's something else. That's what some other groups does, right? That kind of commentary goes into and floods into and leaks into uh, clean energy, right, into energy efficiency. So it's funny when we talk about hiking, but it's not funny when we talk about adoption of energy efficiency technology, of, of getting solar panels or buying an EV car, where there's a feeling, there's a feeling that that isn't for me. And we'll get into that too. Um, I got into my company uh, after doing multiple years of consulting uh, for, um, from the Allen Group, a black woman-owned construction management firm here in San Francisco. At that time, I was going to conferences. I was being really deep into the energy efficiency space and the decarbonization space. And it was there where I started to really, you know, I thought Stanford was a bubble. There was, it was, that was why I was the only black person there, right? <laughs> that couldn't be the industry as a whole. Coming from a historically black university, I knew there was folks out there of different backgrounds that cared about energy and environment. But then I go to conferences and be one of two out of hundreds, right? I go to seminars and uh, professional uh, energy audit trainings and be one of 50, right? And I started to recognize that there was a fundamental problem here, that the energy efficiency space, the clean, and then what I found later, the renewable energy space as a whole, clean energy, clean technology, had a real uh, diversity problem, right? We weren't there. And I say the world we of anybody with... Uh, a little bit more melanin in their skin, right? Um, and then I started talking to my contemporaries, folks who were starting companies, folks who had started companies. Being at Stanford, we had this great opportunity to be involved and connected with individuals uh, who are CEOs, who are startup founders, right? Multi mul multiple time founders. And you start having these conversations with them and I realized all of them agreed that, oh man, you're right, diversity is a problem. All of them agreed that it was important to have diversity. None of them connected that with their, um, the success of their business. None of them, in my view, saw that prioritizing communities of color was how we were going to accelerate our um, decarbonization, was how we were going to uh, be successful in addressing climate change. They, you would hear things like, they're not ready for it. They're not interested in it. Right. They have so much other things going on. We don't want to, um, you know, we'll, we'll get them next. Right. Or um, <laughs> my favorite was, you know, we don't want to test this out on them first. Right. This idea that these communities needed to be, you know, cared for. Right. Because they didn't have the, the, the aptitude, the thought, the desire to be involved in this created this system where we look at the solar panels today and where they are located, right? Just as a, an example. And you see that independent of income, there's a huge disparity of solar panels in black and majority black communities versus majority white communities, right? Independent of income. And so what I wanted to do was create a company that addressed that, right? That addressed this aspect of not only the lack of diversity, but the lack of thoughtfulness to why we should be prioritizing these communities first. And so I founded Gemini Energy Solutions in order to solve that. And I'll just, quick aside, uh, I consult for Clean Energy Works and racial equity. I teach two classes here at Stanford, as John mentioned, and I am co-founder of Clear Decarbonization, which is a, a sustainability accelerator here at Stanford that focuses on bringing decarbonization curriculum in partnership with historically black universities across the country. So all these efforts are driving my core purpose and core path was how do we bring 
more diversity into the space because without that, we can't reach our goals. So um, the other thing I should add is that uh, when I started Gemini Energy Solutions, we got our first tranche of money from the Tomcat Center. So thank you for all those involved at the Tomcat Center. <laughs> um, and and from, the, and from there, we were able to really start developing the platform that led to kind of this automation of analysis and report writing, which we call Conserve, which allows us to train anybody anywhere um, on how on to provide energy audits um, to for, for community managers, community building owners, et cetera. So now we opened that up. And so now to the realities, right? I've mentioned in the beginning of this that I'm going to talk to you about different realities. This is um, one example of the impact of one segment of the U.S. population, right? If you look at that, that is uh, the number of asthma attacks. And you look at where those are on a map. That's going to be relevant, right? Now, this is a map of the black or African-American population. The darker the blue, the denser the population, the, right? The higher majority there is. Now look at air pollution. The red is worse. Starting to see a trend here? Different realities, different cons levels of concern about some of the same problems, right? One thing that we don't r remember often is that our highway system was built predominantly through existing black neighborhoods. We all know what pollution is, the cars pollution levels, buses, trucks, where they go and where they travel. It starts to become very clear why this is happening. Now, intergenerational upward mobility. The darker the red, the worse it is. Uh, a Union of Concerned Scientists, they, they put out an energy burden map uh, by county. And once again, you can start to see a trend here. Uh, the Northeast is very interesting because of the, the fundamental cost of energy up there. And it also, uh, I pull out um, uh, indigenous uh, lands that are highlighted here, right? Uh, right along the border of Mexico, deep reds there. And what I'm, I want to make sure that you understand that energy burden is actually just one side of the coin. Uh, a colleague, a, a former classmate of mine, also from North Carolina A&T, who is now a professor at Carnegie Mellon, Dr. Nest Destiny Nock, is working on uh, this concept of energy deprived. And what you're looking at right now is an energy equity gap uh, by ethnicity within a group. So that black line at the top is for black folks, and that's the difference between low-income black folks and high-income black folks in terms of how high their temperature is in their home before they turn air conditioning on. Think about that. They will, on average, have their temperature 11 degrees higher just to avoid being energy burdened. What that means is they are starting to use, they are, they are, they are using too little energy to, and, and is impacting their health risks. Right. For, in a community that already has high rates of asthma, cancer, of other um, illnesses and diseases, having also uncomfortable temperatures of 80 plus because you are trying to save money so you are not energy burdened. Right. This is something that is this research is something that's really interesting, but it also speaks to how we are still learning. Right. This article came out just last year. Up until last year, everyone just assumed low income folks were either energy burdened or not, right? We're still understanding this space. We're still understanding opportunities for how we can impact and improve people's lives. But once again, a different reality, right? You have a different reality when you are poor. And in this case, if you are poor and black, you have even more of a different reality. The last four maps shown on one slide, so you can kind of see this graphic just to beat it home with a hammer. <laughs> Folks have different realities. And we, in our solution space, have not been recognizing that, have not been um, taking that into account. And it's not just on a health uh, perspective, but also on uh, an economic perspective. We look at the pers persistent poverty gra uh, graphs, right? This is 
counties that have had pers- um, above 20% poverty rates for three decades in a row. Not three decades, period, in a row. That's 1990 to 2010. That's almost as long, right? That 30 years of poverty persistently through there. What does that mean in terms of opportunity? What does that mean for the people who, and I think it's important to recognize that everybody in these communities understand their situation. They're not in a bubble where they're not aware that they are living in a persistent poverty county. They know about it. They talk about it. We often in the industry uh, treat this as they are unaware, right? Or if they do know about it, then it's just something that's just reality for them. They are aware and they're trying to find a solution. And this is important because it is not just community-wide, but it's individual-wide, right? We look at just home ownership, net worth. I always am shocked by this number of difference between uh, the medium net worth. Uh, white families have more wealth than black families, Hispanic and other multiple race families. And this is from 2019. I guarantee you it hasn't changed much. And because of the pandemic, it may have worsened. All right. Look at the separation in that. How does someone's reality change because of that? And then it's not just... Um, you know, economics is also the social justice comes into play with this, right? The school to prison pipeline, I would point out here, male enrollment of 8%, but expulsions of 23%. Research shows that teachers are more likely to see a black student's um, uh, transgressions as part of a trend versus one time. So when they so they have a, high, a higher degree of expulsions because they see this person as a bad kid versus as a kid who made a mistake. What does that happen when you increase expulsions? Well, as just as the uh, prison pipeline states, if you're born in 2001 and you're black, one in three chance of um, being imprisoned. Stark reality, right? Your day to day actions. And when I say reality, you know, for me, it's three aspects. It's your day-to-day interactions. It is your, um, the environment that you must l- uh, live in and, res- and reside in, right? I say must because we have to remember that this is part of a historical effort, right? Redlining and other policies and legal ramifications purposely put people in flood areas, right? Purposely put people uh, in surrounded by highways, purposely put people in poverty-stricken areas. So this isn't a choice. This was part of decades-long purposeful activity. So when I talk about someone's reality, it's part their internal motivations and um, ambitions and goals, but also their environment and their day-to-day experiences. I I can't remember the exact numbers, but in New York at one point during the stop-and-search law uh, rules, there was more black folks stopped and searched in black people in New York City. Think about that. <laughs> that means people were getting stopped and searched multiple times in a year to have that kind of result, right? Your day-to-day interactions. And so, but I don't want people to think of this as a, um, as a income thing, right? One in three is not an income thing. And this shows, and this shows it, you know, really starkly is that race, not income, is their greatest predictor to whether you live next to a polluted air, water, or soil, all right? The color of your skin, a social construct, is the greatest predictor of whether you live next to. And something that I rarely point out, but I think is really important, is that 95% of their claims against the polluters are denied by the EPA. So it's not like they're sitting there living in polluted areas and saying, oh, well, this is life. They are complaining about it. They are filing suits again, and 95% of them are denied, right? So all, uh, this is going to come to a point. This is going to come to a point. It's not just all about gloom and doom. <laughs> but the point here is that this, because of all that, this Stanford study that shows that um, non-whites, in particular, folks on Black and Hispanics, have a higher degree of concern about climate change, 
have a higher and want to see, um, they see it as a very serious problem, right? There's multiple studies. This is one I put up at Stanford because we're here at Stanford. But there's multiple studies that same the, so, the same results. And that is that people in these communities care about it and want to see something done because they connect all this together. They don't see uh, having to not turn on the air conditioning as separate from living near a polluted site, Cancer Alley, right, and other places like this. They see this as all interconnected when you talk with them. And so what that means is when we, what that means is if we are sitting here saying that our surveys and our in-person conversations show that they care more about this than the white Americans, right? Why do they have less electric vehicles? Why do they have less solar panels? Why do they have less energy efficiency technology in their homes, right? And the answer is pretty simple. And that is that technology innovation and commercialization in itself is not sufficient to reach 100% clean energy, right? That we are not providing, that in fact, we need upgrades, we need solutions that not only are available to these communities, not only are accessible, financially accessible to these communities, but are acceptable to these communities, right? Because they see the problem not as I have a high energy bill. They see the problem as I have a high energy bill. I have um, high rates of asthma. I have uh, the, pri- uh, just, uh, the school to prison pipeline to worry about. I have jobs that I-, I have lack of jobs in my community that I want to see filled, right? They see all these are interconnected. So when we come to them with a solution that is not acceptable, well, that, why else would, why, why would they take that? They have to take everything else. They have to take the pollution. They have to take um, the, the, the police disproportionately um, imprisoning them. They have to take uh, their kids being treated as bad youth in their schools. Why would they take unacceptable solutions from the clean energy space? And to give you an idea of how this connects to the larger picture of things, right? We got the governor here in California that established a goal of 3 million climate-ready and climate-friendly homes by 2030 and an additional 7 million by 2035. And at least 50% of the funding to achieve these goals should be directed toward disadvantaged communities. Well, from what I've been telling you already today, do you think they're going to accept just any solution with money tied to it? Do you think that just money is enough? Well, so we have this situation where the reality is these communities in today's industry has three options. If you're able and willing to pay, you can pay with your card. If you're not uh, and you have good enough credit history, you can take out debt to get a clean energy upgrade, right? So it's not enough that you have one-tenth the income as someone who uh, has, uh, who is white in America, but now you also have to go in debt to upgrade to save the planet that you are disproportionately less polluting, <laughs> right? <laughs> or the option, or they just don't participate at all, right? These are your options today. These are, and the result is what we've seen already, the clean energy divide, right? I mentioned solar panels. You can use any single technology in a clean energy space and see the same results. And then even when you do make it av- uh, available, right, Look at these pictures. This is the marketing for solar, right? I don't see myself in them. These communities don't see themselves in them. So even when it is there, that's not for me, right? Like, uh, I, had a, I had a pastor uh, from rural Alabama tell me, if a white guy showed up at, at any of my uh, members' houses, they would first check to see who else is there (laughs) and then listen to them and then close the door in their face because for them although that individual may be wonderful individual right what they see is the history of trauma and that anytime someone white has come into their neighborhood has not been for a good reason right that's the realities that we have to contend with in this clean energy space So a new transition has happened, right? All of a sudden, $369 billion has been passed uh, around October of last year. 
And several aspects of this came into play. Uh, now nonprofits, community-based organizations can have direct pay, right? Instead of the tax credit that only businesses were able to take advantage of, now nonprofits can take advantage of that. Home electrification and decarbonization efforts are now incentivized, so they're less money, right? It's more accessible. Uh, Bidirectional EV charging allows for energy storage where you can actually plug in and draw the energy from the car battery to power your building. Now those are eligible for tax credits, right? More accessible. Uh, now, if you get upgrades in your building, you can actually give the tax credit to the contractor. You can cash that out and say, hey, you know, I can't take advantage of this money, but I know you can. So how about you take this and then do the work, right? All, all more accessible, giving more options here. And there's also these block grants, $3.5 billion and hopefully more coming through from different agencies to focus on disadvantaged communities. 40% of the benefits disadvantaged communities. But once again, it's a lot of money, but we're missing something, right? We have, <laughs> it's, we're gonna have access, we're gonna have, it's gonna be accessible, but is it gonna be culturally relevant? Is it going to be um, acceptable? So entrepreneurs in this space, we have really two options here, right? We can either focus on a single solution. We can say, hey, I'm going to focus on solar. I'm going to focus on EV charging. But as I just said, the community see this as all interconnected, right? The community see jobs in solar industry is the same as ha having a job in the solar industry is just as important as having solar on your house, right? Or you can look at it across sectional, and that's what we decided to do. We said all these different pipe, um, channels, streams are coming down of EV charging, money for EV charging, money for uh, solar, money for energy efficiency, we wanted to work across those sections to provide us a solution that enables us to a approach and deliver an acceptable solution for these communities. And we thought, how do we get that into the communities, right? And this book actually ta ironically talked about this before um, in the parallel of us thinking about how to do this. But I love this book. I have it sitting um, in my apartment right now. And they talked about community anchor strategies. And a, a colleague of mine who is actually running for mayor in Memphis talked to me about community anchors, the importance of community anchors when you're dealing with in housing and how they're trying to work with different community anchors to bring housing uh, folks who have to be displaced back to, into those communities after they rebuild them with more energy efficient housing and how working with these community anchors actually resulted in a higher percentage of displaced, uh, a, a lower percentage of displaced people um, leaving, right? So more percentage of the people who were displaced actually came back in the communities and got the benefits of those nice new houses. So addressing gentrification for those who are wondering. Right? So in this book, they talk about housing authority and medical centers, but what about churches, right? In the black community, the church is the backbone. Right. You think about all of our transitions from um, uh, from the end of slavery to, to, to having slavery abolished, really, to um, Reconstruction through Jim Crow, through the Civil Rights Movement. The black church is one of these staple organizations within our communities. It, it is one of the few places where you have a cross sectional of engagement. And so what we thought about was, well, how about we treat churches as community anchors? They're trusted organizations, they have regular community interactions, and they own their own property, right? One of the few places that the property hasn't diminished over the decades. Black farmers have lost property, um, black businesses have lost property, uh, black households have lost property. The black church is one of those few places that haven't seen a considerable loss in property. And so as I talked about, we wanted to do, provide a solution that looked at the cross-sectional and we wanted to use community anchors. So what exactly, um, and one thing, someone asked me about this actually earlier today, I said, well, how do you connect with these community anchors, right? They're, they're in every community. There's 70,000 census tracts in America, you know, 13,000 plus are considered low uh, disadvantaged. How do you connect, connect with these community anchors? We, we don't go one at, one at a time. 
what we do is we work with partners. I mentioned Green to Church. All right. These partners have decades worth of trust already established within these groups. Decades worth of trust already um, created with these community anchors. And as a result, we don't have to recreate that trust. As, as, as you talk about these things and you're in classes, you're going to hear this come up a lot, trust. Right? Because that is the key to getting someone to find, uh, to actually give you the time to determine if your solution is acceptable, trust. And what I like to say is we move at the speed of trust. And most people in the industry think that's really slow. Um, I, in an example, in two slides, I'll show you why that isn't the case. So our, our solution is, um, you know, our vision is, oh, I guess our solution is uh, a revenue generating microgrid, right? And a microgrid that uses both resiliency and revenue generation as a way to start to seed um, this aspect of clean technology, making it more familiar for the folks, making it look like that is what they, that, that, is, that fits with their identity, right? So imagine when you go to church on Sunday, you see a building management system on the display right next to the scripture, <laughs> right? You see you, on the roof, there's the solar panels. In the parking lot, there are charging stations with the pastor's EV vehicle powering the church, right? Imagine what that could mean for the community and what they see, think about clean technology, whether they would want that next. There's also this uh, research called seeding, right? Seeding effect. And what we found is that uh, communities that have, uh, the first house happens, uh, get solar, right? And what you see is there's a seeding effect where the rest of the community starts to get solar at an accelerated rate. What we've actually seen, um, one study out of Connecticut showed that communities of color actually seed faster. So once it's in one place, then it spreads even faster than um, in white communities. So once again, all this is going back to this idea of um, accessible uh, and acceptable, right? Being critical. So Hayward, uh, it, right, over the, right across the bridge, Glad Tidings uh, International Church of God in Christ is been working in the, this, their community for 40 years, right? They are uh, undoubtedly a community anchor who COVID, um, hurricane um, support elsewhere, as well as food pantries and things here in their communities, right? And what they are super excited about is being the first prototype for this revenue generating microgrid, one that uses bi-directional EV charging, one that uses uh, solar uh, as a way to power the charging stations, not just try to get money from net metering, right? So, and in their case, not only are they're excited about being the first, but they're excited about what this means for the community, the revenue and what they could do for their community about. They're thinking, can we, they asked me in a meeting, so can we just plug up our solar panels to all the houses around us, right? Like that's, that's what they're thinking about, is how do we expand our impact to the community, all right? But that's just one church. What about scale? Right? Because as an entrepreneur, that's very important. I can't make a living off of one church. Um, <laughs> the African Methodist Episcopal Church is a very hierarchical level. Right? And, and they have uh, bishops who um, run each of these regions. So as you can see, Region 5 is quite large. Um, we are already in conversation, and our partners are already in conversation with Region 6, 9, 1, uh, 13, um, and I believe two already in two months, <laughs> right? Because we are not selling the technology. What we are selling is something different. Right? And I'll get to that. At, this is going to be the coup de gras. <laughs> so when we talk about scale, they, um, and we talk, oh, I talked about speed of trust, sorry. So the, the, Assistant to the bishop, who in their framing is actually kind of like the, the COO, <laughs> interestingly enough, just how they describe, that's the title of the name, but it's like the COO to the bishop, said, hey, we want to do 100 churches throughout Georgia this summer. And I said, okay, that's, that's a lot of money, but okay. <laughs> um, sounds great for my bottom line. Uh, how are we going to do this? Are we going to, you know, how are we going to get these 100 churches? They have 550, by the way, across the state. 
so how, how are we going to get, are we going to do webinars every week for a few months, you know, like a different times so that people, the pastors can come and, and make it in their schedule? He's like, oh, no, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He said, like, we're going to have two meetings. We're going to have the bishop at both of those meetings. And we're going to tell the church that, that we expect, the, all, we're going to tell the pastor that we expect, that the bishop expects them to be there. Two meetings. <laughs> and people think speed of trust is slow. Right, like uh, having that relationship with someone who knows the politics of a space, it changes the whole game. It makes things move faster than you could ever imagine. Right, like if I told you I got to get 100 churches, as a black churchgoer, I was the trustee of my church down the street. Like I know the black church. Me getting 100 churches by myself in a summer, whew, I wouldn't see my family much. Right, two meetings. Speed of trust. And then last example is uh, the Christ the King uh, uh, thank you, Episcopal Church. Woo! Bum below my words. Um, it's a Hispanic church, actually, uh, who uh, Reverend Michael Malcolm, uh, who is a, is a big deal down in the South, um, uh, he connected me with this church because they want to create a laboratory. They, the pastor I talked with last week, he said, I want every single type of solar panel you could think of. I want the bendy ones. I want the ones <laughs> on the roof. I want the ones in the yard. I want people to see what is available to them. Right? Like, that is what's happening in these communities. When I talk with these churches, they're not, they're not wondering what this stuff is. They know what it is. They want access to it. They want it. But they want it in a solution that is acceptable. So what is acceptable? What makes us different? Well, our revenue generating microgrids, the key difference is that they have ownership of them. They have ownership of them. Most of the industry will come to a church and say, hey, we're going to lease you with solar panels. We're going to lease you your charging stations. And we're going to even pay you a little bit for as a thank you for that, a token gesture of thank you for uh, this work. And, you know, you'll get a few churches like, well, I need resiliency. I need to make sure the lights are on. Right. But then I talk to them and I'm introduced by another pastor uh, and say, you know, this brother's from Ph.D. from Stanford. Right. He went to HBCU. Right. All winning things. Right. (laughs) And and I start talking and there's nothing they haven't heard before. But then I say, hey, we're not going to treat you like the music industry. What I mean by that is in the music industry, for those who don't know, the artists makes all the content and gets pennies on the dollar for their music, right? The label gets all the money. And this was a huge issue in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. That's what we're doing right now in the clean energy space. We're asking these churches to take on, to to give us their roof, give us their parking lot, and we'll give them pennies on the dollar. And I said, I'm not going to treat you like that. We're going to be co-developers. We're going to develop this together. And you're going to have ownership of it, which also means... Yes, that means you got to maintain it. A big selling point is, oh, you won't have to worry about maintenance or operations. <laughs> Don't worry about it, right? That's, their, that's the selling point. That's what they'll say in these meetings. I tell them, yes, you're going to have to maintain it. That means jobs in your community, right? They love to hear that. They want responsibility for this. It's counterintuitive to a lot of people in the industry, but that's the reality. They want ownership because that also means revenue generation. Just if I went to 13,000 communities, one church in 13,000 communities, we could do $4 billion in revenue a year, 4,000 megawatts or 4 gigawatts of energy produced a year, and 4,000 jobs with our, uh, what I call clean energy hubs, our revenue generating microgrids, right? That's just 13,000 within disadvantaged communities. But, and apologies for the small, this is the map of (laughs) ministries, of churches in the States. A lot more than 13,000, right? What could that mean for these communities to have that level of wealth generation, which they can then reinvest into climate change solutions? The number of jobs, who, of folks who finally can see someone that looks like them in these jobs. And so with that, I'll end um, with this idea. Uh, and actually, um, it's a call to all of you and those listening. And that is, we are still figuring this out. One of the fundamental barriers we're seeing is that this is something new. 
in financial institutions and other groups see things as new as fundamentally risky, right? And what we've ta had conversations with was that most folks, federal government or in the industry, their biggest concern is demand, right? How do we get demand in these communities? We have the demand, but we have a model that's different. And so what we need from academics, from professionals, from institutions is how can we grow this, right? How can we continue this trend of looking for solutions that are acceptable to these communities, that look across the, uh, across the sector of their challenges and addresses them? And so I ask you all to either reach out to me or come and develop your own. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony. That was uh, totally inspiring uh, and eye-opening, I must say. Uh, so thank you very much. We have time for a few questions in the room here. Anybody want to go first? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't all stand up at once. No, I'm just kidding. inspiring. Uh, I like the idea of the community engagement, investment, growth in the community. My question is a complement to the church model. Is there a community college model that you might want to consider? As far as, as, as I can see, most of the same students who are looking for opportunity are going to go to a, a community college. And those spots, I, I understand there's government that may slow things down a little bit rel relative to the velocity of the ministry. But um, they have real estate. Mm -hmm. They have a job training program. Mm -hmm. They have people in the community that want to teach the young folks there. And they can provide also jobs. So I'm wondering, in addition to this, is there you know, the, the sibling with community colleges? Thank you. Um, so not yet with community colleges, though Glad Tidings is actually bringing in the community college for their project. So what's great about working with as a co-developer with these groups is they bring in the organizations that they see are doing good work. So they're bringing in a community college for their work about workforce because they want to do workforce development in addition in this hub. Um, we are working uh, with my colleague uh, for Optimal Tech, Dr. Reginald Parker, we are working where he's doing 40, uh, they do a 40 HBCUs. So we're doing a, a whole program of 40 HBCUs in lieu of, <laughs> kind of a reference to 40 acres and a mule. <laughs> and so um, that is actually, there's an application pro, uh, process going on right now, and HBCUs are applying to be a part of this program. So, Great to hear that. yeah. This is amazing work, Anthony. Uh, bravo. Where, where is the Catholic Bishops' Conference or any of the bishops' conferences? And I ask it because I know from the stuff that I've done, you know, with the Vatican, that there were recently encyclicals about how Catholics specifically should invest in sustainable, um, you know, projects. And they have some pension money. So, <laughs> so from what I've, what I've seen. Um, so how, how does the bishops telling the local folk what to do translate into the bishops taking some of the pension and the other money and supporting this? That's a great question. Um, while I haven't talked with the Catholic Church yet, I'm open to talking to any denominations interested in this, by the way. Um, uh, one of our, par our Green to Church, our main partner for the black church, that's their focus. And so we, we identify partners for each demographic, right, um, that specialize in each demographic. Uh, they're, you know, they we're just talking to me about this last week, right? There's a lot of money in these churches that are sitting there in pensions at the, at the denominational, national domination level. How can we get those to be investing into these projects um, so that you keep a, a cycle of um, money coming through and, and also removing some of the barriers that the financial institutions have for this? So it's a conversation that's just starting, um, and I'm sure we're going to talk more about it soon. <laughs> Thank you. Very inspiring. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, my question is, how are you um, funding your current projects? Where are you getting the finances from? Um, are you raising venture capital, or uh, what's your source of money? <laughs> thanks, thanks for the question. Um, where are we getting the uh, money for, from right now? Well, uh, there was a nonprofit that actually pays for the technical feasibility studies that we were doing for these churches, uh, but we, we exceeded their demand so fast that they ran out of money. 
so that was originally how we were doing this. Uh, ourselves, I think, are, used, are doing more uh, microgrid studies than all their other people combined to give you an idea of demand, right? Um, now we're actually trying to think through that. Uh, there's uh, pre-development funding. It's arguably one of the hardest tranches of money to get. And so we're still trying to explore opportunities there uh, that don't require you know, a 20% down payment or things like that um, of this pre-development funds. Uh, there are venture capital, uh, not venture capitalists, there are private equity firms that we're in uh, conversation with. I, my company itself, we are trying for venture capitalist funding. I'm an accelerator right now uh, to really learn the, how to talk the language of VCs, right? That just like talking a PhD language, VCs have their own language and having to talk to them and, and explain the business model f from metrics that they care about. So we're trying to hit all different aspects of the money though. But if anybody out there wants to just say, hey, I think this is great, throw money at it, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> So following on that, I had a couple of quick questions. So yep. last quarter, we actually had um, Sarah Carney, who runs Prime Coalition, which is impact investing. Have yes. you talked to those folks? I have not yet. You ought to. And I they ought think to talk so. to you. Uh, the second, maybe this is a totally bad idea, is we did have the uh, lead in the administration on uh, environmental justice. It, he's at CEQ here a few weeks ago. Mm. Have you talked to them? That's not direct funding for the business, but if you could figure out how to, you're already doing this, how to best use the incentives in the IRA, that seems like it would give you a lot of leverage in what you're doing. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, the Inflation Reduction Act is, is key. And one of the things that's challenging that people don't realize is the flow of money. And so there's grants coming out, but uh, they take six months, nine months, right? That's a long extent of time and so we are trying to have these conversations within the government to kind of supersede that like hey them, yeah. yes um there's a new trades uh group called black owners of solar services solar services uh they just received 6.3 million dollars from a collaborative agreement with the department of energy mm -hmm. right and we were and we partner with them on things so there's efforts around collaborative agreements within the federal government that we're trying to have those conversations mm -hmm. with and love anybody who's connected in there to help us with those conversations, but that is absolutely kind yeah, of a route. Yeah. Uh, the other one I can think of in this regard is uh, Holmes actually had Shalanda Baker come yes. and do a Dean's thing, so have you talked to her? Oh yes, we, we, we had a chance to talk before uh, she uh, was in her position at the D Department of Energy, and I got to see her just last week, so um, yeah. Excellent. Great. Uh, you know, any other questions in the, in the room? At this point, I think we're just about out of time anyway. So, Anthony, thank you so much. That was definitely inspiring and eye-opening uh, to the infinite power. As nerdy little aeronautical engineers like me used to say, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay.